If there's one thing you take away from this video, just one thing, you have learned what it took me three years and three exams to get ingrained into my brain. Hi friends, I'm Jason. Welcome back to the Updive channel, the best place for beginners to dive into all things finance, investments, and money topics. And in this video, I'm gonna give you a full picture about bond investing, what it is, what to look out for, and by the end of this, you know how you can put your money in bonds that works for your situation. Here's a quick question for you. Do you invest more money in bonds or stocks and why? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're new here, do consider subscribing because my channel makes new videos every week. It's all about making finance and investment topics easy for beginners. And if you like or learned anything, I appreciate if you hit that like button because it's a huge encouragement for me. Cool, let's dive right in. So a bond is basically a loan. Except that instead of you borrowing the money, it's you that's lending the money to governments or companies. And in return, you earn interest. So both the principal and interest are fixed. And that's why you hear the term fixed income uh, gets thrown out a lot as well. And bonds is a legal agreement between you and the borrower. And what's more, as the bondholder, you know, compared to being a stockholder, you are in a much more safer position. Because when things go bad, to the company or the government, you're among the first in line to get back your money first. So here's what I mean. So if you bought into a company's bonds and a company goes under or bankrupt, okay, you get to claim your money first when the company begins selling off its assets uh, to pay back its loans and debts you know, way before stockholders do. So you're probably thinking, you know, why don't governments or companies just go to banks to get loans, right? You know, why bonds? Well, they already do, but just that bonds it's just, just another choice for them. You know, in some cases, then, you know, let's say the US government, right, they borrowed $3 trillion in just six months uh, last year, right? Because no normal or single bank has the amount of money to lend or take on all that risk. So these borrowers issue bonds. So I'm on the SEC website, so that's the regulator's website, and this is about the Apple bond offering, which is a prospectus. So prospectus is like a sales brochure, but with a lot of, lot of information. This prospectus is like 40 or 50 pages. And it's something just companies must do if they want to raise money from the public, whether it's bonds or stocks, a prospectus would be the first thing that you see. Uh, but I'm going to highlight you the main information about this bond and uh, what you usually see. So the first thing is about the bond issuer. So here you definitely see it's Apple. So bond issuer is who's issuing the bonds, who's borrowing the money. So here it's Apple. So you will be lending uh, money to Apple. And here you see the issuing amount, which is $7 billion. So here you can see that this uh, $7 billion is broken into different tranches, so uh, different notes. So notes is another word for bonds, and it's a different maturity date. So maturity is like, it's like a deadline when they will give you back the money. So 2022, 2024, 26, 29, 29, and so forth. So here you will see a percentage, right? this is the interest rate, also known as the coupon rate. So that's like the bond jargon. I don't know why they call it a coupon, they just do. So as you can see that this uh, interest rate or coupon rate actually increases the further down maturity you go. So it works exactly the same like our bank term deposits. The longer the money you're willing to lock in with your bank, the more interest rate that you receive. So this is exactly the same for bonds as well. And the term face value. So bonds usually work in packets of a thousand dollars. So if a company borrows a million dollars, they'll sell a thousand bonds with a face value of a thousand dollars each to borrow a million dollars. Now there are three main benefits for buying bonds. One, it is safer. So this we briefly talked about before. So it is safer than stocks because you are in line first to get your money back when things go bad. Two, it's more predictable. Okay, you already know what returns that you will get when you buy. So you can't really say that about stocks. You know, even for dividends, it's only indicative. It's not guaranteed. So yes, even Wall Street doesn't know, but they pretend they do. Bonds are less volatile, right? Bond prices, like all assets, they move up and down. But most of the time, it's really minimal, you know, compared to stocks because there is certainty in the expected return that you will get. You know this beforehand and you're pretty sure that it's gonna happen. So you can't really say that about stocks. You, you just don't know. All right, you can't say that about gold either, and you definitely can't do that for Bitcoin. So any predictions on price on any other assets, it's really just a hunch. But bonds aren't perfect, you know, there are drawbacks as well. So here are the two main ones where investing in bonds that you usually find uh, by the book or what other YouTubers usually talk about, and a special me, I'm gonna throw in a third one you know, in after that. I'm so generous, right? So the first drawback is what you call default risk, and this is the risk when the bond issuer or the borrower just doesn't pay. Now we call this in default. 
and it covers when borrowers don't pay on time, they miss one payment, three payments, and doesn't pay fully. So any of the above, it's called debt default. The second type of drawback is interest rate risk. Now this is a big one, and that's what happens when the general market interest rate, the interest rate out there, you know, changes in relationship to the bonds that you already have. I know it sounds like a mouthful, but it's really, really common sense. So here's how. Let's say you bought a single Tesla bond, you know, that pays a 5% coupon semi-annually, twice a year, and it matures in 10 years. So for this, you'll be receiving $25 in coupons every six months until this bond matures, where Tesla will pay you back $1,000 at the end of 10 years. Now, let's say the interest rate spiked up to, for whatever reason, to 10%. So Tesla issues a new bond that pays 10% coupon semi-annually, and it matures in five years. So as a rational investor, okay, what looks more attractive, the 10% coupon or the 5% coupon? Hmm, what looks more attractive? Of course the 10%, right? right? So the price of your 5% coupon bond is going to fall right, because of this. However, it doesn't mean you made a loss. So if you hold that bond to maturity right up to the end of the decade, Right, you will still give back your original principal. But if you sell it now, today, after the price dropped, yes, you will make a loss. But the good thing is, because interest rates have increased, it also means that additional investments you make in bonds will also have higher interest payments. So money generally loses value over time, right? It's generally two to 3% per year. And you can blame these people in governments and central bankers, right? Because our money is made of paper and paper is easy to print, but they just want to print it controllably. Right, but bonds are really terrible choice to actually beat inflation. You know, other than maybe certain inflation-linked bonds, but that's really out of scope for this video. Uh, but still, in general, they're a terrible choice of investment to outdo inflation because inflation becomes a big concern for you. You know, be in stocks, be in precious metals or other hard assets like real estate. You know, they will do a better job in keeping their value uh, to inflation rather better than bonds. So generally, there are two ways of making money in bonds, holding them to maturity, then collecting interest payments along the way, or buying low and selling high when the bond prices rise. If you are investing in bonds directly, here's a strategy that you can consider, you know, quite simple and easy to do. Let's say you're starting off investing $60,000 in bonds. So one obvious way to invest this money is you can invest all of it into one single bond. But the drawback for this is that you will get most of your money locked in and only get back this money at the end of five years. Obviously, you still will get interest payments along the way, you receive that as an income, but most of the money is locked in. So another approach is the bond ladder approach. So instead of investing all in one go, you can split it up in different baskets. So here I split this $60,000 into three different bonds, and most importantly, in three different maturities. So 20,000 in a bond that matures in one year, another 20,000 that matures end of two years, and the last 20,000 then invest in a bond that matures in three years. So at the end of one year, this is what happens. So because bond A matures in one year, you would get that principal at the end of one year and you use it to invest in bond D at with $20,000. Then at the end of two years, bond B will mature and you use that 20,000 that you get back in principal and you invest in bond E. So because you're investing these bonds in different maturities, you will also have the more flexibility of not having to have most of your money locked in into one single year, but rather at different maturities, and you can reinvest almost automatically as you go forward. And other good point about this bond ladder strategy is that you also get diversification because you are not investing all your $60,000 into one single bond, but into different bonds at different maturities. And but before you get too excited to go out there and buy bonds, there's also one more player between you and the borrower, and that's credit ratings agencies. So as individuals, you know, you and I, we have a credit score, you know, which is maintained by companies like TransUnion or like Equifax. You know, companies and governments have similar ones as well, and they are managed by credit ratings agencies like S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. This is a representation of how credit ratings are done by the big three, so S&P, Fitch, and Moody's. Then you see that their system is actually very, very similar, and some use numbers, uh, some use letters and symbols, but generally it works the same way. So if it's on the same row, it's the same level of risk, and it goes from the lowest risk to the highest risk. And the risk is measured by credit worthiness, so how or what the likelihood is that a particular borrower will pay you back. So this is the low risk, means they will most often definitely nearly virtually uh, pay you back to a high risk where it's entirely speculative. 
But the two most important things about this chart is one, the first, the categorization, which is investment grade or high yield bonds. And the second most important thing is actually a line, which is the, this middle line, which separates these two categorizations. The reason being is a lot of fund managers, uh, when they are, they have some rules, right? Some investment mandates. So let's say they are only allowed to invest in investment grade uh, bonds. So if suddenly one of the credit rating agencies says, oh, this particular bond or this particular borrower that you invested in or lent money to is now not investment grade anymore, it's now high yield bonds, then a lot of these fund managers will be forced to sell because they are only allowed to invest in investment grade. So that's why a lot of people pay attention to these, uh, the big three, the credit rating agencies, because uh, they hold a lot of sway in the bond markets. Remember these ratings by these credit agencies, they're really just opinions. You know, even if they rate something triple A, AAA, it's not a guarantee. You know, even though you know, many people, investors and institutions still rely on them. I mean, they've done it before in the GFC, the great financial crisis, they rated bonds that were full of high risk as triple A and later it turned out to be frogs. So they weren't really on the hook for their wrong opinions because really it was just opinions. So how do you buy bonds? How do you buy it, right? So bonds, unlike the stock market, it doesn't really have like a stock exchange. There's no New York bond exchange, right? So, or some kind of central exchange. So all bonds are traded OTC or over the counter. How much for your bond? This one? How about 102? 102? So $1,020? That's right. Deal? My acting skills are just awful. And so basically between banks, brokers, and dealers, and that's where bonds are traded. So if you'd like to start buying bonds, you need an account with these intermediaries, okay? Even someone like a Federal Reserve that wants to buy you know, US government bonds, they don't buy directly from the US Treasury, they go through these intermediaries as well. Because of the cost and commissions in single bond issues, it would actually be much better for you to buy bond index funds or ETFs, which stands for exchange traded funds, you know, if you'd like to get started. Because they are way, way cheaper. And those funds can buy and sell bonds in bulk. And if you'd like to know about the difference between these two funds, you can check out my video here, where I go into four differences about the differences between these two funds. With these bond funds, you can still get those interest coupons. You are still in a safer investment. Just this time, it's distributed to you by the fund. And it just makes total sense. I mean, why pay commissions of one to 5% each time for buying a single bond uh, when bond funds charge you less than half a percent for a whole year? So here are two funds that you can check out. You know, they differ in risk level and what they invest in. But I'll point out some of the important information that you can use for reference, you know, when you check out other funds as well. So while I'm on the Vanguard website, and this is the VGLT ETF. So this is a very, very safe choice. So let's see what's inside. You can see that this ETF holds mainly US Treasury bonds and it actually holds long-term bonds to 10 to 25 years. And the expense ratio is very, very low. So 0.05%. So we can scroll, scroll down more and to see a bit more information. I don't know why here it says risk potential is three. For me, this is extremely low risk, uh, but also uh, not much reward as well. But if you want something that's safe, that you get consistent income, this is something that you can really check out. So look at the characteristics of this ETF. You can see that this, uh, this ETF holds around 60 bonds. Again, 99.9% .9 is US government bonds. So it's very, very safe. And this is a long-term, uh, how many bonds, uh, the average effective maturity. And then the yield or the interest that you can expect to earn on this return this ETF is 1.5%. So definitely a very, very uh, safe bond. But if you want to use it to you know, beat inflation, uh, don't really count on this. But if you want consistent income, reliable income, that you don't want to lose your principal, this is something that you actually uh, can check out. So this is another Vanguard bond ETF, also very low cost. But the difference between this one and the one before is this one also includes company corporate bonds. So you will have a higher coupon, a higher interest rate, just based on the fact that company bonds have more risk than government bonds. But I won't say this is very much risk of an increase just to get a higher coupon, but you'll see below for more information later. You can see that the expense ratio is also very, very cheap, 0.05%, which is exactly the same price as the last one. And then if you go down for more information, you can see that this bonds has a heck a lot of number of bonds. So it's very, very well diversified. It's equally also long-term bonds. So long-term bonds usually have higher interest. And you see that in middle maturity, there is a pickup. The one just then was under 2%. Now this one is more than 2.3%. Now you can look at the breakdown of portfolio composition. So 40% of this bond, uh, the ETF bonds 
are in U.S. government bonds, so very, very safe. Then there's 60% into or investment grade from AAA, then AA, A, and uh, BAA. So this is definitely or investment grade bonds. So in terms of credit quality, it is very, very high. And you because of you investing in a portion in company bonds, you're looking to have an, uh, in, uh, higher interest and higher yield uh, compared to one that only invests in government bonds. One thing, one takeaway in this video, remember, is that interest rates move in the opposite direction of bond prices. So this is one of the big takeaways that I had when I studied for the CFA exam for over three years, which is a super hard exam in the financial world for those that don't know. And it's really easy to remember. Okay, use any tool, a ruler or a pencil. So one side is an interest rate and the other side is bond prices. Okay, press down on the interest rate and bond prices move up. Push up on the interest rate and bond prices go down. So ignore what happened just then. Hope this video was useful to shine a bit more light into this area. So please do give this video a like if you haven't already. And if you'd like to see some commentaries on the market sometimes, I also post it on Twitter and Instagram. I'll leave these handles here. So if you still have any questions on bonds, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If not, happy investing, and I'll see you in the next video.